Hello, my name is Dr. Eric Landrum from the Department of Psychology at Boise State University, and this is my research method screencast about within groups designs. As you may recall from a prior screencast, the between versus within groups design distinction is one of the four basic building blocks of all experimental designs. And in fact, I want to recap that distinction here briefly at the beginning of this screencast because I think it really uh, makes the point clear. And there's a really great example by Goodwin that I want to share with you. So just to start us off with a definition as we typically do to frame the discussion for this screencast, within groups designs it makes sense when volunteers are scarce because the population of interest may be small. A really nice advantage of the within groups design is that they can help to eliminate or at least minimize the equivalent groups problem of between groups designs. And so uh, typically in a within groups design you're working with either groups that are very similar to one another or it's a repeated measures where you're actually testing the same person over and over. And the phrase that you'll hear there sometimes is that each person serves as his or her own control subject. And we'll get into the, the nitty gritty of that here shortly. So just to harken back really briefly to that between groups design, again, this is a, a hitting golf balls example from Goodwin 2005, which is really just a, a really nice example. So think about the graphic that's on the screen right now. I might have 10 golf pros. I could randomly assign them to two groups. You can see pros in the first group, pros in the second group. And uh, I've got, uh, they're, they're hitting two different golf balls. So maybe I'm a golf ball manufacturer and I want to see if my ball is as, can be hit as far as the, the leading golf ball. So that might be a Titleist or a, Okay, so you, you, you caught me. I'm really not a golfer. So, but anyway, hopefully that you, you can see the, the notion here. So the mean and standard deviation at the bottom there, so the mean distance the five pros hit golf ball one was 253 yards. And the mean distance that the pros in the second group hit golf ball two is 265 yards. And it would be nice for the manufacturer, especially if they're golf ball two, to say that our balls get hit on average from 12 yards further uh, with roughly the same standard deviations. That that's, uh, seems reasonable in terms of the variability there. But, but always as researchers and experimenters, we're thinking about the conclusions and we're thinking about potential alternative explanations. And as we get into that, you can, I hope, we'll see the kind of intuitive natural advantage of a within groups design. And we'll harken back to this golf ball um, example here in a moment. Is that we may have to think about what are the possible explanations that might help us uh, understand why golf ball two was hit harder and longer or traveled a greater distance to be technical than golf ball one. Well, first off, there's always chance. We're dealing with human beings. There are chance, there's chance operating. Uh, this we call a type one error sometimes, and you'll hear about that in a different screencast. Um, but that could certainly be, you know, just those five people tend to be different from the other five people. It could be random chance operating. It could be a better golf ball. That's what the manufacturers of golf ball too want to be able to say. It's not that golfers by chance hit our balls further, but it's that the golf ball is a better ball. It travels better. And so that's going to be the research hypothesis. But there's also a third um, explanation. And I think if you stop and think about it, it will be pretty obvious to you. The third difference is individ the, the third explanation is individual differences. And so maybe the golfers, the five golfers in group two are tend to be just stronger golfers than group one. Maybe a random chance, a, I'm sorry, random assignment to groups didn't do a great job with low ends. We know that's a case sometimes. And so maybe there were differences in the groups before the golf balls were even introduced. And so it's not a chance issue. It's not that the ball is better in one group, but it's the golfers are stronger in one group compared to the other group. And that could be the alternative explanation for why the golf ball two traveled further than golf ball one. And there, all three of these explanations are plausible. And as a researcher, we want to try to, you know, test the uh, dependent variable 
uh, manipulate the independent variable and as best as possible hold all other conditions constant. That's the basic definition of an experiment. And that's really going to be the benefit of using a within groups design. Now you see a different um, configuration of this study as a within groups design. Again, this is from Goodwin 2005. So now I'm only using five pros, but they're each hitting golf ball one and golf ball two. Now there are some new uh, concerns about that. There are some possible alternative explanations. We'll get to those eventually, and we'll be fair with that. But now look what happens. And so now golf ball two travels further than golf ball one. It's not because the two groups of golfers were different because there are no two groups of golfers. This is a within groups design each golfer gets every condition every value of the independent variable all right it's just like uh, every taste tester gets chocolate vanilla and strawberry ice cream as opposed to three separate groups getting chocolate vanilla or strawberry ice cream and so now with a within groups design those first two issues we saw on the prior screen I'm going to show them to you again uh, still exist there's still chance operating it still could be that golf ball two is better but now we've gotten rid of that possible alternative explanation of between groups differences because no, we don't have between groups anymore and so here's that just that to recap that old explanation number three individual differences goes away with within groups designs um, also uh, j just as an aside uh, the statistical calculations with the same group used more than once or within groups design in general are a little bit more precise and refined than a two group a two group between groups difference. And so there are some statistical advantages to within groups testing in addition to the methodological advantages. All right, so to, to, to kind of recap this notion in a within groups design, each group participates at each level or combination of independent variables. And to translate that, our, the golfing group, you know, the five golfers in the within groups design, got both golf ball one and golf ball two. So golf ball one, golf ball two, that's the independent variable, two levels. The dependent variable was the number of yards traveled. So in a within groups design, uh, the participants get every level of the independent variable, not just one level like you would in a between groups design. So the key concept here is called blocking. And this is actually a term that, you know, blocking and plots. We're about to get to that one too. This, these are terms that come from agricultural research. And so you can imagine an agricultural researcher using a strip of land, but it's contiguous. It's next to one another. And, and the characteristics are very similar in terms of the amount of sunlight that land gets during the day, the erosion factors, the runoff, the moisture, the nutrients in the soil. You can imagine, and from one acre adjacent to another acre, that they're pretty similar to one another. So those adjacent plots in a strip of agricultural land are similar to one another. Well, we're going to take that analogy and we're going to carry it forward to human beings and we're going to try to block on variables that describe very similar groups of people. And those variables clearly must need to be related to the hypothesis we're testing and the prior research that's been done in the area. So here it would be a kind of a simple example about the agricultural version. You can see in the rows and can think about each of these squares being an acre. So we're talking about an eight acre plot of land. You can see uh, there are four acres, the rows, and where the whole plot, the whole row gets treated the same. And so irrigation method one is the top row, irrigation method two is the bottom row. But now if you look at the columns, you can split that plot. And so uh, you can see, and maybe it's hard to see in this graphic, but fertilizer one versus fertilizer two. And notice if you look really carefully that some, you know, sometimes you flip the order. So if you're looking at the first column, the one on top is one, the one on the bottom is B. Move over to the next column, the one on top is two, uh, and the one on the bottom is one. And so you can see that there's some, there's some uh, manipulation of the order of going on there. And we'll come back to that in a couple of slides from now. 
So, so that's the notion from agriculture. And it makes good sense if you think about it. Well, we're going to try to do that, but with human beings on, and, and we're not going to be talking about soil similarity, but similarity on certain key variables. That might be intelligence. It might be GPA. It might be uh, ethnicity or socioeconomic status. And so those are the variables that we're going to be uh, thinking about a lot of times in within groups designs. So blocking our, our agricultural interpretation or translation is that we're going to be we're going to desire a homogeneous group of participants that are utilized to reduce errors due to subject differences. And so homogeneous just means similar to one another on whatever key variables we're interested in. And we're reducing errors. That is, re remember that third explanation of individual difference. Well, we wouldn't want to conclude that golf ball two is better than golf ball one. Uh, we don't want to be careful with that because if we draw that conclusion in between groups design, there's a possibility of error. And error doesn't really mean mistake is a calculation mistake, but error really means here a, a conclusion that w isn't necessarily true. And so we don't want to draw the wrong conclusion. We, want to, we don't want to make an error in that way of using the word error. So one of the classics here is a repeated measures design, have each subject or participant exposed to all levels or combinations of the independent variable. And so uh, I, I think that the best classic example is a weight loss study. So in a weight loss study, you go in and get yourself weighed at the beginning and you get yourself weighed at the end and you are your own control. That is to say, and maybe you were in the treatment group where you got the new weight loss drug or regimen, or maybe you were in the control group where you didn't get a new regimen, but you maybe you got a placebo drug to take. And so the notion being that I'm not going to compare you against um, an, a separate group of people in a different condition of the study. I'm going to compare you at the beginning of the study uh, to you at the end of the study. And that's that repeated measure. So the repeated measure in this case would be the scale weight. And so you got on and you weight X number of pounds at the beginning, Y number of pounds at the end. That, that weighing is the repeated measure and you, uh, there was no between groups. You were compared against you. That's the notion here. So blocking is really a, a little bit of a variation on matching. If you recall from the between groups screencast, um, we would uh, pair people up and then we would flip a coin there and then we could randomly assign from the pairs who went into the treatment group, who went into the control groups. So now, rather than do that individually, we're going to do that a homogeneous block at a time. And let me try to give you some examples of that. And so if we know that intelligence is related to our hypothesis or our dependent measure outcome, we might block, we might give some sort of intelligence test, get some scores, and then block our participants based on a high level and low level. Um, blocking does assume that people within a group would score the same on the dependent variable. And again, how are you going to know that in your research study? By reading the literature, by doing a lit search, by using psych info, by using those tools that psychology majors use. Once you, you know the variable and you've measured it and you've got your block of high and low, then you can split each block or plot into an experimental group or a control group or a treatment group control group. I'm going to try to give you this graphically uh, here. Um, and so you can kind of recall my example from the between group screencast about the 20 students and the GPAs we got from the registrar's office. We rank order those there on the far left of the screen from top to bottom. And then we're going to do draw a line at the very middle and split the top 10 from the bottom 10. We're going to call the top 10 the high GPA group. So that's a block. And then the bottom 10 GPA group, that's another block. Okay. So then we're, then we're going to take that block and we're going to randomly split it into high GPA one split and then high GPA another split. You can see if you kind of keep moving across the screen there, a lower GPA split. And then we can assign either experimental group or control group. So rather than pair people individually and then flip a coin like we did with between groups, now we're dealing with blocks or groups of people in a within groups design. We're going to split that group. We're going to call that split plot. And then we can randomly assign the block to either the experimental or control condition of the study. So just with every type of research design, there are challenges, potentially drawbacks that we need to think about. 
So order effects, uh, one treatment may influence another treatment. And so if uh, you're in your ice cream study and you want to compare the uh, flavor ratings of chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry, uh, the order sometimes for some people might make a difference. And so if you come in and you're a chocolate fan and you taste chocolate first, well, you might give lower ratings to vanilla and strawberry because of the order or because of pre-existing conditions, not because of the quality of the ice cream per se. And so to counteract that, we can actually then, if we believe that's going to be the case, we can present the ice cream in different order to different people. And so you can think about this. So chocolate won't always come first. Sometimes vanilla will come first. Sometimes strawberry would come first. And there's actually a little formula that I'll give you here in a moment the how we how we calculate the different number of orders we might need. Another thing that happens, because remember, this is over time typically with repeated measures at least, um, sometimes you'll see this thing called progressive error, that uh, your behavior, and my behavior too for that matter, might change during the course of a study but due to the passage of time and not due to the independent variable manipulation. And sometimes you'll see this as a, a positive, so you, you, get, you start getting those cues and you pay attention to them, or you might see it as a negative, so there's some fatigue over time. And so you start a weight loss study and you're all jacked and excited and you do the exercise regimen every day for the first three days, and then it gets kind of tiring and boring, and then all of a sudden your, your behavior changes. And it's not because of the regimen per se, but it's because of your change and, and your decisions. And so we have to be careful and design our studies in such a way to minimize these special considerations. Also, and especially when you're looking at change over time, uh, weight loss study be a classic one, but there's other conditions where this happens. You have to look at ceiling and floor effects. And so essentially the notion is you want to start in a place where someone has a chance to get better and a chance to get worse. So let's say that we are looking at uh, improving students' writing. Maybe uh, they're writing in APA format. And we have a pre where we have you write a little essay. And then we're gonna have you, have you attend a writing workshop. Then we're gonna do a post and have you write a similar essay. And we're gonna compare it to your pre to your post. And we're gonna have an independent panel of judges rate these essays, both pre and post. Well, let's say it's out of 100 possible points, and let's say on the first essay, you scored 97, and you take the workshop, and then at the, on the post essay, you scored 98. Well, the problem there is that you were so close to the ceiling to begin with, there wasn't much room for you to grow. That would, we would call that a ceiling effect. It's the same thing at the bottom with a floor effect. If you're a pretty good golfer and you're, you know, you're very good and you've got this low number of shots, so maybe you shoot on average a 70 and I try to put you in a golf clinic to change your swing. If you're at the very low bottom floor of most golfers for 18 holes, uh, if you're so close to the floor, it's hard to get better than where you already are. Okay. And so, um, we, we don't want the starting value to be near the top of the values or near the bottom of the values if we're trying to reduce something. We, we want room to grow. Uh, we want to be able to test the hypothesis that the independent variable might make things better or might make things worse. But we need some space on both ends of the uh, numerical scale that we're using. So sometimes it's a ceiling effect, sometimes it's a floor effect. There are other carryover effects that might happen. Again, uh, these tend to th we think about these over time. Uh, you might become fatigued and so less attentive, less rapid, less motivated. Let's say I'm, a I'm asking you to watch a hundred commercials and I'm asking you to rate the um, the how convincing each converse, each commercial is with regard to changing your behavior about buying a product. Um, over time, if I'm asking you about the 75th commercial, you may be bored, much more bored than you were at the third commercial. And so um, sometimes in a repeated measures where each participant is getting every level of the independent variable manipulation, um, if there's too many levels there, you might see fatigue. Or you could see in some cases practice effects. All right. And so maybe it's not you're rating commercials, but Maybe you're in a GRE study group and you're giving math problems. And maybe um, you're giving 50 math problems. And in fact, over time, just the sheer practice of doing math is making you better and more confident at those future math problems. And so 
Sometimes the passage of time and mere exposure to a situation could uh, actually influence positively your future performance, or as you saw in the prior example, Im impact it negatively. I mentioned order effects earlier. If we were talking about our three levels of ice cream, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry, we don't want the results to be due to the order of presentation of the levels of the independent variable. We just want it to be due to the independent variable. So we might vary the orders. And actually, there's a little formula here to do that. It's, by the way, the process is called counterbalancing. And so we're going to we're going to over a series of participants provide every order possible. And then we can treat order as an independent variable and measure its impact. And the formula for that is n factorial. And so uh, with chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry, um, that's three flavors. And n factorial means uh, multiply a number uh, by every whole number below it down to one. So three factorial is a fancy way of saying three times two times one. There are six possible orders of three flavors of ice cream to be presented to participants. And I'm gonna do, I don't have it on the screen for you, so I'm just gonna talk you through it, and you can track me and make sure I don't make any mistakes. There's chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, strawberry, chocolate, strawberry, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, vanilla, chocolate. If I was careful there, there were six different orders of those three flavors of ice cream. So if you had four, four factor factorial would be four times three times two times one, all right, which should be 12, that'd be 24 different orders. And wow, now, you're, now your experiment gets even more complex because now you're gonna have 24 different versions of what you're presenting to participants. And so you can see that you need to really carefully think about the design because it may impact the number of participants that you need. By the way, we saw this in between groups when we looked at matching. So if you're matching on multiple variables, you needed a whole bunch of folks just to pre-qualify for the study before you actually then implemented your independent variable manipulation. So some of the, just to be fair here, we looked at some of the drawbacks, but let's conclude with some of the advantages of between measures designs. Um, it's fewer participants, and so uh, rather than having three groups of people tasting chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, we have one group tasting all three flavors. That's a little bit more efficient. It takes fewer participants. It's powerful, and I mean this in the statistical way of being powerful. That is, it's easier to find a significant difference in a within groups design, generally speaking, than it is in a between groups design, all other things being equal. And so it's a little bit more efficient, it's more powerful. Um, it's limitations to between measures and within groups designs. Uh, we've kind of talked about these a little bit, but it's a good thing to recap here. This design's not gonna work well if the experimental manipulation um, in a good way here, uh, irreversibly changes the participants. And so you can see my example here on the screen. Let's say that I am developing a little software program to help students learn how to format their APA papers on Microsoft Word. And I have three different, for maybe I'm going to have you watch a video tutor in one condition, maybe I'm going to have you listen to a screencast. Uh, that's pretty much the same as a video tutor. I'm going to have you read instructions off of a handout for a second condition. And in the third condition, I'm just going to let you fumble and bumble and figure it out for yourself. Hopefully you can see that if I give you the screencast first, there's going to be some carryover effect to the fumble and bumble version. That's version two versus the handout version. If I give you the handout first, hopefully there's going to be some carryover, some memory for that by the time that you get to the screencast instructional version. And so if there's actually a change in behavior or memory, uh, then within groups might not be the best uh, design option. With chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, the idea is that you could probably cleanse your palate. You probably eat a saltine cracker. You know, it's a fresh start with each flavor, but with a training method, it may not be a fresh start. You're not just going to unerase the experience and then start fresh again. And so in that kind of situation, a between groups design map might make a lot more sense. And again, we've just been talking about these carryover effects because you might have something carry over from the first condition to the second condition. And lastly, this is a concern too with uh, between groups designs, 
we called it matching back then. Here we call it blocking. We've got to have the that availability of homogeneous participants. And so in that prior example, I've got to have that block of high GPA, low GPA available to me. So I've got to go out and figure that out before I really start the real part of my experimental manipulation in my research study. I want to kind of close it out here. And sometimes this is confusing to students, and I apologize, but I, if you can wrap your head around it, I think it's a good way to think about it. So blocks in a within groups design, a block can be a homogeneous set of participants that then get randomly designed into conditions. Or, and again, hang in there with me, the block could be one person that gets repeatedly tested at different levels. So you can think about it, I've got a homogeneous group that then can be split out and tested, or that one person is the item or object being tested as in a weight loss study. So they're their own control group. And so there's nothing more homogeneous than you compared to you. Maybe that's the best way to say it. Anyway, I hope that makes it a little bit clearer. And that's it for me and this Psych321 Research Methods screencast.